Thank you very much for that introduction, Dima. Uh, and by my own request, he introduced me as Vaki, which is the name I generally go by. But if you see my name on postdoc applications this season, please look for Evangelos, my uh, real first name. OK, so as you just heard, I will be, uh, I, David and I will be giving a kind of linked talk about a recent joint work that he and I did with Todd Kemp on non-commutative stochastic calculus. Um, and as you, as you will see, I kind of get to do the fun part, which is uh, background and motivation. I'll explain in a second. First, what is stochastic calculus? Um, it is the branch of stochastic analysis, continuous time stochastic analysis, that concerns results and constructions uh, about stochastic integrals, quadratic variation, Ito's formula, stochastic differential equations, and the like. I'm going to elucidate some of these terms later, uh, so don't worry if they don't mean anything to you. So the goal of the, our joint work is, I guess, threefold goals. Introduce a new approach to constructing non-commutative stochastic integrals. Develop a general theory of non-commutative quadratic variation uh, for the first time in the literature. Uh, and to prove a general form of a non-commutative ethos formula. Um, so the goal of this talk is I'm going to explain mostly classical stochastic calculus um, as a way to frame and motivate uh, the definitions and constructions that we'll do that David will tell you about. With that in mind, here is the outline of the talk. First, I'll give you a very brief explanation of why uh, non-commutative stochastic calculus is interesting and uh, um, why one should care about it. Second, um, and the, most of the talk will be devoted to uh, discussing the basic objects of classical stochastic calculus. And then the talk will end with uh, a list of tasks that uh, one needs to accomplish to non-commutativize the classical case. I'll discuss a little bit of the ideas behind how we accomplish those tasks, and then David will actually tell you the, the theory that we developed. So to get started, uh, why, why would you care about um, non-commutative stochastic calculus? Well, first of all, perhaps for its own sake, I think a lot of people in the room are motivated to consider non-commutative versions of classical probability concepts just for their own sake. Um, in the case of stochastic calculus, the most important objects, as you'll see, as I'll explain to you, are semi-martingales and quadratic variation. Um, and these actually have not been addressed uh, in previous work, at least in a general framework. Um, these works listed and some others, they focus on uh, non-commutative processes that have some kind of Brownian or Gaussian or Levy process character, as opposed to what might be a general semi-martingale. Um, but you know, applications are usually more interesting than just the answer for its own sake. So even quote, just free stochastic calculus, which is stochastic calculus for free Brownian motion, developed in these middle three papers of Chumer, Spiker, Bion, and Bion and Spiker, has a lot of applications and has seen many over the years and continues to see many. Um, I'll make a little list. It's not an exhaustive list, nor are the references that I give going to be exhaustive, but it gives a little flavor of at least why I care about stochastic calculus, free stochastic calculus. Um, there's lots of applications to free entropy and transport. Um, there are recent applications to calculating Brown measures. This is the PDE method that Ping Zhang mentioned in uh, the previous talk. Um, the PDEs that he's talking about are derived using free stochastic calculus. And then also, there are applications to characterizing large end limits of various n by n random matrix ensembles. Most uh, interestingly to me, um, solutions to matrix SDEs and characterizing the large limits of solutions to matrix stochastic differential equations. Uh, this is, in fact, my uh, probably most significant current research focus, and it's what uh, led me to caring about non-commutative stochastic calculus in the first place. And once again, a little disclaimer, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, so now I'll start the second part, which is actually telling you what are some of the basic objects of classical stochastic calculus. And I'll give you really the bare minimum to understand Ito's formula, which is uh, the fundamental theorem of stochastic calculus. You'll see why that name might seem appropriate uh, once I state it. Uh, but to, fix, to uh, start off, I'll fix some finite dimensional vector spaces, V, W, and X. And without loss of generality, if I need them, they'll be inner product spaces. Uh, and also a filtered probability space. Uh, that is a probability space, omega FP. And the filtration FT is an increasing collection of sub-sigma algebras. In the non-commutative case, as David will tell you, this will be replaced with a tracial von Neumann algebra and an increasing family of sub-von Neumann algebras of the overlying one. 
So first I'll define what a stochastic process is. You can think of it as a, a collection of random variables uh, indexed by uh, the positive real line, the times. So it's a map from R plus uh, cross omega to, for example, V, but it could be any measurable space. Um, and such that at each time, you, uh, the variable xt, which is just the random variable x, and you freeze t in the argument of this map, that is a uh, measurable. Um, now, if you say the word adapted, what you mean is that at each time, this random variable is adapted to the filtration at that time, meaning it's uh, measurable with respect to ft. So that's an adapted stochastic process with values in v. Next, the, the most kind of fundamental object in stochastic calculus is called a semi-martingale. Um, a continuous v-valued semi-martingale is a v-valued stochastic process, like right here, that admits a decomposition m plus a, where m is some continuous local martingale, and a is some continuous fv process. Now, fv here stands for finite variation, and what it means is that the paths of a have locally bounded variation, almost surely. Um, don't worry about the word local in local martingale, uh, but the martingale property defines what a martingale is, at least. So, um, uh, as a kind of little review, this is what the martingale property says. And m is some kind of object that satisfies some version of this. Okay, just looking at this definition, it seems very contrived, and the, its use is not so clear. Um, there's actually a, a theorem that says, loosely speaking, uh, that semi-martingales are precisely the stochastic processes um, that are useful for stochastic integration. I won't formulate a precise version of this theorem, but I will tell you a quick and dirty way that you can know that many stochastic integrals against x make sense. That's what we'll see uh, uh, shortly. I'll pause for just a sec so you can take this in and then I'll move on. Okay, so now I'll tell you some stochastic integrals that make sense. First, I will introduce some notations for partitions of an interval zero to t that will be very useful for both this talk and for David's talk. So pi for me is going to be a partition of the interval zero to t. And then for a member of this partition, s, which maybe it's ti in this labeling, I'll write s sub minus to be the member of the partition to the left of s, so ti minus one, delta s to be the Partition increment, s minus, s minus. And then if you have a function defined on this interval with values in a vector space, then you'll, we'll write delta s f for this increment of f in the partition interval. And finally, absolute value of pi will be the, the partition mesh of pi. And we'll frequently consider limits as the mesh goes to zero. For example, here. So if x is a v-valued semi-martingale, as I defined on the previous slide, and if you have a stochastic process with values in the linear maps from V to W, and say it's continuous and adapted, then you can define a W-valued stochastic integral, denoted as integral zero to T, H dx. And I put these brackets here to emphasize that H is a linear map and it's being applied to the increment ds, the infinitesimal increment ds. And, uh, the definition, if you will, at least for this talk, is going to be this limit in probability, that's what L0 means, limit in probability, as the partition mesh goes to zero of these left endpoint riemann stieltjes sums. Now, for these semi-martingales, actually this endpoint matters. If you pick a different endpoint, like the right endpoint, you won't get the same answer. For example, for Brownian motion. Uh, if X is a Brownian motion, then you will get different answers if you pick left endpoint versus some other endpoint evaluation scheme. And then it's also a fact that this stochastic integral process, so if you put all of these uh, random variables together into a stochastic process, this is a W-valued semi-martingale. So this, this uh, definition that I've just explained to you is not really a definition usually, it's kind of more of a, a result in the development. The construction is not done as you might expect from how I've defined it through sort of Riemann type integration theory, but um, uh, the easiest way to state that you can make sense of a lot of stochastic integrals is uh, uh, through this Riemann-Stiltjes uh, uh, construction. 
Time permitting, I'll say a little bit more about the construction, the classical construction of stochastic integrals. But for now, when I write a stochastic integral like this, you can think of left endpoint Riemann still feels uh, something. Okay, the next most important object that shows up in Ito's formula, and one of the most important objects in stochastic calculus, is called the quadratic covariation of two semi martingales. And I'll give you the construction slash definition of this object. So the input is two semi martingales. Let's say one is V valued and the other is W valued. So they can be valued in different spaces. And we're going to build a stochastic process with values in the tensor product V tensor W. And I claim that first of all, uh, this limit exists. So this is again a limit over um, partitions as the mesh goes to zero. And this time we have two increments, the delta X increment and the delta Y increment. So if X and Y were smooth, this would just be zero. But actually you get non-zero answers if you consider things like Brownian motion. So first, this uh, limit exists. And actually there's a nice formula for it in terms of stochastic integrals. So this is uh, called the Ito product rule because you should think of this as uh, X times Y. And then you've got a DXY and an X DY. And this thing on the other side, you're supposed to think of as DX DY. Hence these increments right here. I'll leave that up for a second so you can digest. Okay. Now if you put all these guys together into a stochastic process, which I denote by these brackets, this is a continuous V tensor W valued FV process. So it has locally bounded variation. Its paths have locally bounded variation. In particular, you can uh, stochastically or Riemann Stiltius integrate against this process. And we are going to make some notation for integrals against this quadratic covariation process. So given it has values in this space, when we integrate uh, a linear map valued process, we should take a linear map valued process that has values in linear maps from this space to another vector space, x. But those can be identified and it will be useful for us to identify, given the finite dimensionality of everything, uh, this space as the space of bilinear maps from V cross W with values in X. So if we have such a lambda, this is going to be a uh, continuous process, I will write integral lambda dx dy for a quadratic covariation integral. And that is defined to be the Riemann Stiltius integral of lambda against this process with locally bounded variation. So this, to reiterate, this is a Riemann Stiltius integral, path by path. And this notation right here, this dx dy thing, is justified for the following reason. You can actually show, very similarly to up here, that this is given by a formula where you apply lambda, so it's a bilinear map. You can plug in the delta x and you can plug in the delta y. And actually, in this case, um, I have an S star here. In this case, the endpoint does not matter. You can pick whatever uh, uh, endpoints you want to compute this integral. So I think the most important takeaway from this slide, which perhaps is a little technical, is that when you see this symbol written here, it means this limit of uh, quadratic Riemann Stiltius sums. And the statement is that that limit exists for uh, semi martingales X and Y. Okay, so now we have collected the necessary objects to state Ito's formula. That is what I will do in the following slide. So Ito's formula, just like I said, is uh, the fundamental theorem of stochastic calculus. So we're gonna have a function f and a semi-martingale x, and we're gonna get some calculus expression for f of x. So the input is you have an open set u of v, a v-valued semi-martingale that actually almost surely takes values in u, and then a C2 map from u to w. And then Ito's formula states this equation, df of x equals the first derivative of f at x, dx. That would be the thing you would expect from the usual chain rule or fundamental theorem of calculus. And then plus this extra term, which I'll discuss in a second, one half, the second derivative, integrated dx, dx. Now I've written this in differential notation, and this is common in stochastic analysis, but it's actually short for this integral equation. It says that the process f of x 
is equal to its starting point, f at x0, plus this stochastic integral uh, against x, plus 1 half this quadratic uh, variation integral of this uh, d squared f. And then just to be clear, the dfx process is the linear map valued Frechet derivative process. So at each time, it's going to be the directional derivative map evaluated at the process xt or at the random variable xt. Similarly, d squared f at x is going to be the bilinear map valued second Frechet derivative or Hessian process. So at each time, this process is given by the uh, second directional derivative map evaluated at the random variable xt. All right, once again, perhaps a lot to keep track of, so I'll give a little pause so that you can uh, digest or ask questions if you want. Okay. So this extra term is known as the Ito correction term, uh, and it involves two separate calculations. One is that of the second derivative of f, this is a purely calculus computation that has nothing to do with stochastic processes. And then the second one is you need to compute the quadratic variation rules uh, for x. And uh, the, the most classic example that you see is uh, whenever you see db db, where b is a Brownian motion, you can replace it with dt. So the, the quadratic variation process, that bracket for b, is actually just t. So that tells you how to uh, evaluate these integrals here. But I emphasize that these are separate calculations, and actually um, uh, the way that the non-commutative literature has kind of escaped doing a general theory of semi-martingales and quadratic variation is that they've kind of uh, treated this term as one single entity, not two separate calculations. Um, that is convenient for when you're dealing with special processes, but it actually makes uh, computations a little bit tougher, and it makes the theory a little bit less uh, computationally flexible, so we're, gonna, uh, no, we're not going to favor that. So that's the comment I'll make about that. Okay, so I've rewritten Ito's formula here, so we can move into the last piece of the talk, which is I'm going to describe to you which tasks must be accomplished if you want to make sense of this formula in a non-commutative setting. So there's kind of four objects here, and each of the tasks will be devoted to uh, explaining or uh, converting each object into a non-commutative version of itself. Okay, so here are the four tasks. First of all, we need to know what x is. So we need a non-commutative analog of a semi-martingale. As David will tell you, it'll be some kind of non-commutative martingale plus some kind of non-commutative FV process. I'll let David tell you about that. Um, second, for such an x, such a non-commutative process x, we've got to make sense of uh, stochastic integrals h dx for some sufficiently large collection of adapted linear map valued processes, some adapted non-commutative linear map valued processes. In particular, sufficiently many should include some fresh A derivatives uh, of uh, functions that you're interested in. Number three, for pairs of such processes, you need to construct quadratic covariation integrals uh, of adapted bilinear map valued processes. And then finally, you've got to define an appropriate class of C2 maps uh, that give you, that satisfy this non-commutative analog, or a, a non-commutative analog of uh, this formula right here. So um, I will briefly explain the, the ideas behind the constructions that David will explain to you for tasks two through four. And I will highlight and potentially spend the most time on um, number two, specifically the definition of adaptedness for linear map valued processes that we introduce, which is entirely novel and definitely requires some explanation. So I'll give you that explanation, uh, how we thought of it, which is thinking about what adaptedness means for classical linear map valued processes. That's what I'll begin right on the second slide, or the slide after this. Okay, so here's the idea for that definition of adaptedness that uh, David will later show you for linear map valued processes. So let's consider a, um, a uniformly bounded, for simplicity, um, classical stochastic process with values in linear maps from V to W. That's the kind of thing that we constructed, or that I told you you could construct stochastic integrals of. That's the integrand. So we're going to non-commutativize it by converting it into a map H tilde 
which is just now a path. So notice this omega is here. In non-commutative situations, you don't get to consider omegas one by one. You have to consider all of them at the same time, p almost surely or something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move p almost all these omegas onto this side and consider a path with values in the bounded linear maps from the v-valued LP random variable to the LP, uh, sorry, to the w-valued LP random variables. P can be whatever you want in this. Um, for us, it'll be mostly two uh, in David's talk. Um, but this, uh, this motivational explanation works for any P group. Okay, and the definition is uh, kind of following your nose. So at a time t, we're supposed to plug in a v-valued random variable. I'll write that x. And what we're going to define it as is the random variable linear map, the random linear map ht, applied to the random vector x. Uh, very explicitly, this is the definition. And this will, in fact, be, because this is a bounded stochastic process, this will, in fact, be a v value, a w valued LP random variable. OK. So the, the key observation is what it means uh, in this non commutativized version, what it means for H to be adapted classically. And I'm, I've got a little elementary fact. It's a little bit of a lie because you need a, a slight technical assumption, but uh, no problem. 25 minute talk, that's what you get. Um, the classical process H is adapted if and only if the non-commutativized process H tilde satisfies this identity. And now on one side we have a W-valued random variable and we take a conditional expectation onto the youth sigma algebra. And the statement is that this uh, map uh, HT, or sorry, HT tilde commutes with uh, conditional expectations at later times. So for u greater than or equal to t, greater than or equal to zero, we get this commutation relation for all v-valued LP random variables. Okay, I'll leave you to um, digest that for a sec. So this, as I've told you, inspires uh, a non-commutative notion of adaptedness for linear map-valued processes where the, the linear maps are between non-commutative LP spaces. Uh, and we will use such adapted li linear map-valued processes as our integrands in our stochastic integral. Uh, and this allows us to somewhat mimic the classical approach, which uses an identity called the Ito isometry. Um, and David will tell you about how uh, our non-commutative construction goes. Okay, for tasks three and four, uh, remember task three is constructing a quadratic covariation integral in a non-commutative setting. And for, um, for fairly deep reasons, and that are somewhat conjectural, but if you want to hear more about that, let me know. Um, it seems not possible in the non-commutative case to construct an analog of this identity in a useful tensor product. It seems like tensor products that you can construct this uh, in are not useful for Ito's formula. But this is somewhat of a deep thing that, again, is a little conjectural on my part. But as a result, we're going to focus on non-commutativizing these quadratic variation integrals directly by first uh, adapting, pun intended, the notion of an adapted bilinear map-valued process, kind of similar to how we did the linear map-valued process, uh, and then second, starting with a more complicated Ito product rule for lambda xy in place of x tensor y. And uh, David will tell you how that goes. And then finally, uh, the way you get the idea for our class of functions for Ito's formula is uh, you note that if you take a classical C2 map from v to w, then this map induces a C2 map of these L infinity V valued random variables to L infinity W valued random variables. Um, just again, by doing the thing that you should do, you should plug in this random, uh, uh, random vector into your deterministic function to get another random vector. And now you can show that this is a, a C2 map between these two L infinity spaces, but it's not arbitrary. You, you can observe various ways that it respects the filtration. Uh, and so, you can't naively expect that in the non-commutative case, you can just apply this for uh, all C2 maps. You need some kind of adaptedness condition. And by studying the exact way that this F star map respects the filtration, 
and how its derivatives also have a property that respect the filtration, we came up with a kind of abstract notion of adapted C2 from a subset of one uh, non-commutative probability space uh, to another. And David will tell you about that. Such adapted C2 maps end up being uh, nice and work very well for uh, a general form of non-commutative Ito's formula. And they include uh, um, basically all uh, uh, good examples from the, the literature that currently exists. Okay, I had a couple more slides um, about some extra stuff, uh, but I think I will actually leave it right here for now. So thank you very much. <laughs>